Shall we pray? Father, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable and honouring to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Will you sleep well tonight, no matter what you face tomorrow? Sadly, too many Christians fear things we ought not to fear, and we lose sleep over them. (coughs) Scientists tell us that we need deep REM sleep to be truly rested. Rapid eye movement sleep, that's critical to our health. It's more than physical sleep. And more than physical sleep, we need spiritual REM sleep. Maybe to put it in a weird sort of way, do you have spiritual bags under your eyes? Yes, we say, I believe in God, and we can recite the creed as we did this morning, but do you really rest when you lie down to sleep? Only the one true Saviour has rapid eye movement sleep for the soul. And this passage is about that as it records a conflict over the Sabbath day, the rest day. It's all about rest. Jesus heals a lame man and he tells him to take up his mat on the Sabbath which provokes debate over his authority. Jewish attacks focus on how he breaks their Sabbath rules, and how he makes himself equal with God. Jesus' defence answers our deepest needs about where to find real rest and human flourishing, true life. So all through here, he is challenging them, he challenges us to honour him, to honour the Son. So let's paint the picture to see the point. Probably a passage you're very familiar with, but let me just review it quickly. He heals, Jesus heals the lame man on the Sabbath, and then he says, get up, take up your bed and walk. It was a mat of some kind, and Jewish leaders have scores of laws surrounding each actual law of God. And they have all these extra laws to ensure that they never even get close to breaking one of the commandments. Pretty good thinking if you're just thinking purely humanly level. Now, one rule is that you can't carry anything. If you can wear your sleeping mat as a cloak, that's fine, it's clothing. You can take it with you. But if you roll it up and then carry it, no. That's work and you break the rest, the Sabbath. Similarly, just another one to give a picture. You may walk a maximum of about a kilometre on the Sabbath. Any more is work. But if on Friday you take some food, just a bit short of a kilometre, and then on the Saturday you go and eat there, you can then carry on another Sabbath day's journey without breaking the law. So in this way, and a myriad of extra rules, all surrounding God's commandments, you can honestly say, as that rich young ruler does elsewhere that talks to Jesus, I've never broken the law. No. And he honestly believes it. He wasn't being a stupid idiot. But it's all externals. And they make it so that you can actually rest in your own work. I've done it. And it was especially easy to, if you were one of the power elite who had enough time and money to devote your life to it. You see, if you had been working for 12 hours on the Friday, you wouldn't have time and energy to quickly nip up the road and drop some food off at someone else's place and arrange it all so you could actually walk two Sabbath days journey the next day. You didn't have time for that. But if you're part of a religious power elite, they had the money, they had the time, they could keep the laws. So it was easy to see that the Pharisees and people like them were seen as they were super holy and all of us ordinary people, we don't match up. 
And at a purely human level, that's really exactly the way it was. If you didn't have the time and money to devote your life to it, you couldn't be like that rich young ruler and say, I've never broken the law. Because we all knew we would, all the time. And John chapter 5 verse 16 says, this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Jesus is challenging the religious power elite. And then he answers them in verse 17 with very inflammatory words. My father is working until now and I am working. As verse 18 goes on to explain, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So here's Jesus, and he reveals himself as the one who gives the true Sabbath rest. That's why I ask the question that I do. Do you rest in him, really? Or are you, like those Jewish religious leaders, always working out your own way to feel right and good about yourself? Maybe you rely on your bank account, everything's okay so long as I'm financially secure. Or if someone in your family goes off the rails, you lose it. And I've seen that happen. And... It's really hard, but do you really lose it or are you still going to be trusting in Jesus? And I know that we have people here who testify they have trusted in Jesus, even through desperate situations in their family. Or maybe it's all about preserving your health. For many people today, that's where the main game is. The thing is, it's more precarious as you get older Nowadays, sadly, we rarely seem to stress about Sabbath keeping. It's just not on the radar at all. Um, I think we should take the Lord's Day seriously. Absolutely, as a day of rest from labour. But this hits us as we ponder where we find rest. The point is, more to do with honouring God himself and Jesus as God Or are we just paying lip service to him? Like the Jews did. They had their rules. They followed them well. They saw it as honouring God, but it was really only paying lip service to him with their myriad of laws. If we keep enough, if they keep enough, they feel good and they rest in their own efforts. It's the same for us. If we keep enough of whatever our moral values are we feel good and we rest in our own efforts but that is not a right use of the law God's law you could call it God's family rules they they were all put there in the scriptures to be a mirror on our souls in the mirror of the law we see how we fail to measure up to God's perfection we realise we have a problem the mirror of the law actually shows each one of us that we are dead in sin and hopeless and helpless just as Jesus goes on to say here in verse 21 it's all about the father and the son giving life and without that we're hopeless and helpless In verse 24 he states it bluntly. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Passes from death to life. Honouring the Son means resting in his work, not your own. Now, some people object. They say, that's just stupid to honour God. Why? Well, they come up with what they see is really important reasons why it's stupid. And one is that he never answers. He doesn't speak. He is silent. And the silence of God in the face of suffering is a problem, even for committed Christians. Our world is filled with suffering, but generally God doesn't seem to remove the woe. 
and it's actually a key attack on Christianity by people such as David Attenborough or the New Atheists or even the Aboriginal lady who was sitting down to the meal provided by Fremantle Church a couple of Saturday evenings ago where she asked, well, where's God in the life of my people who have suffered so much? Now, that's one objection people raise to what I'm saying and then another one is this. They just say, well, questions about God have no answers because religious language, it's only symbolic, it's meaningless God talk. So the first attack says that God may be present but he's silent and the next says that even the idea of God is meaningless claptrap. God is not there, so religious terms, they have no rational value. Why do non-Christians then say things like, God bless you, or bless you? On the lips of a Christian, that has meaning. It's a prayer uh, that the God who created our world and in Christ died to redeem us will keep and enrich you. It's a good prayer. But what meaning does God bless have for a non-Christian? Really? Really? Or an unbelieving parliamentarian who says our thoughts and prayers are with you to a town that's devastated by a bushfire. It's only used for emotional or psychological value to try and create a good feeling in the ears of the hearers. Now, many say that that is all religious talk is good for. Manipulative value psychological value but no real meaning. Another way of expressing this is how the historian Edward Gibbon in his um, Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire he put it when he was writing of the first Christian century that all the world's religions were viewed by common people as equally true by philosophers as equally false and by the rulers as equally useful. And in that society, it's very much like ours, truth is relative, God talk becomes meaningless. So, against these views, Christianity is unique, stands apart. We know that God has spoken, that he has spoken clearly, and that what he has said is true. Jesus teaches that right here in John 5. In verses 16 to 24, he teaches that we can know God because God the Father is revealed in the Son. So that denies the second objection. And if we know him rightly, we will honour him and exalt him. And in verse 18, Jesus' activities provoke the Jews to see it plainly right in front of their face. Jesus made himself equal with God and we know it's because he is God. Healing a lame man at the pool, that that was nothing. He's going to raise people from the dead very shortly. He has authority to give life. That flattens any objections we may have about suffering. Because how did he have that authority to give life? It was in himself. And even that he would come down from perfection in glory to live the life of a humble, poor carpenter and then to endure much suffering and even to death on the cross. Unjustly. For someone, the only one who's lived a perfect life, to die a criminal's death like that a tortured death like that. That is total suffering, which no one else in the world has endured anything like. So here's the answer to that other objection about suffering. Jesus is the answer. The answer to all the Sunday school questions they're ever asked, isn't it? Jesus. If a five-year-old can come up with Jesus, they're going to get most of the Sunday school questions correct. But it's true. All the promises of Scripture are yes in Christ Jesus. So, what's he doing here? Jesus is claiming in verse 17, My Father is working until now and I am working. So he's saying much more than what the Jews would even begin to contemplate. They just see a bloke 
from Nazareth, a carpenter, beginning to make a name for himself and being a pain in the neck. But they're missing what's going on. He says that the Father is working with him in all he does in his earthly life. And also, and here's the crunch, the Father has been working with him and he with the Father in all of their actions previously. In other words, Jesus is turning the Jewish listeners back to before the foundation of the world, to God's work from the beginning and from the beginning of creation. And Jesus is saying, that's my work. I'm in there too. Now, this is critical to know who Jesus is. It isn't enough just to think of him in his time when he lived on earth a couple of thousand years ago. It's easy if you do just put him into uh, the time of the four Gospels to just dismiss him then as a great teacher. Someone back in history that ho-hum history, who cares? We are an ahistorical nation today. History is bunk. Henry Ford said it a hundred years ago and we're proving it every day. I speak to so many people, young and old. I mention something casually to my manager who's actually got a uni degree. He's 27 years old, manager who I employ at work. And I mentioned Winston Churchill and he says, who? You know, don't think this isn't happening. Our whole education system, I won't go there. It's a system. It's an industry. It's not about learning. It's got nothing to do with learning. Just, I mean that. If you want to talk about it, I can wax lyrical. I've got it family in academia but look this is what the Jews were being forced to do to look at history and see how Jesus fitted into the whole picture and Jesus forces us to do it here too let me give you a picture in the 1960s the temple of Luxor in Egypt was being excavated Huge columns in this temple are about 4 metres in diameter and about 20 metres or more high. Now, before the excavations reached out past the edge of town to a particular area on the outskirts of the modern city of Luxor, a farmer had been looking for solid foundations for his house and he dug in the sand and hit what he believed was bedrock. He built his house there all well and good. When the archaeological dig reached there, the earth was removed and his house was left standing 20 metres up in the air. Now, this is like most people's misunderstanding of Jesus. They acknowledge he was a great man, maybe even claim that their lives are built on him to some degree, after all he's a great teacher, That's true. But by itself, that is misleading. And it's as misleading as the view of the Egyptian farmer who thought he built his house on bedrock and it was far from it. To have a true understanding of Jesus, you need to push aside the thousands of years of human history and catch a picture of him existing from before time with God the Father and working with God the Father from eternity past. Jesus always has been, he is and he always will be the crunch comes when you realise that this perfect unity that he's always had with the Father continues on and God sustaining all things right now, that is Jesus' work too, by his word of power and if that means that Jesus breaks the Jewish legalist rules about Sabbath keeping, then so be it And those religious leaders, they are. They are right there ready to stone Jesus because of what he says and does. They know it's a unique claim that he's making to be God. He doesn't just say he is a son of God. There's a sense in which anyone can say we're a son of God. There is a sense that we can say that. But no, he's saying he is the son of God. And the Jewish leaders certainly know what Jesus claims here because they're about to kill him. We may miss it, they don't. And the second point that Jesus makes here 
concerning his relationship to the Father is that his identity with the Father involves obedience. Now this is what many people struggle to get their heads around. Well, if he's obeying the Father, the Father must be the boss. No! No, they're united in their will. They're in, in agreement. But he uniquely is the one who came to earth, not the Father. And so he obeys their will in coming to earth. The mind of the Father and the mind of the Son are united. Now, people dismiss that and they say, well, it must mean that he's a zombie or a robot or something. But we just don't have enough brain cells, I'm afraid, to put this all into a neat little box. He has personality, he has intellect, he has feelings, but he does nothing except what he sees the Father doing. And they're on the same page. He faces real temptations, real discouragements, and nevertheless, he always obeys his father willingly. He's no robot. He came down as a matter of honour. Now, we humans, we have a real problem at this point because true honour, that's not in our sinful nature. We refuse to honour our one true Creator and Lord. We decided right from the get-go with Adam that created things are more worthy of honour than God. Try and push God out. We live for our own honour. The just penalty for that cruel, heartless dishonour to the one true Lord of the universe was paid when the King left his glory and came down to live and ultimately die on the cross for his people. He took the dishonour that we deserve, the penalty that we deserve. And when he did that, all our natural human ideas and common sense of what's up and what's down, he totally turns on on its head. Why? Well, he shows that the way up is down. Because that's what he did. He came down. When Jesus was tortured and killed in apparent weakness, it was his greatest triumph. The great disaster was the greatest victory. He was run through by the spear and yet he won the field. He won the battle. The victory's done. As a result, he's now back up on top at the place of highest honour as judge of all things. Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's where the honour needs to go, not for us. So the way to blessing is to take the curse. That's what Jesus is saying. The way to riches is to give everything away. The way to get honour is to honour your father and others. The way to heal brokenness is not to avoid brokenness, but to plunge in. And that's what Jesus did. He came to earth, he plunged in, and he submitted to God's will. And if Jesus was doing, willing to do that, surely we must be too, if we call ourselves his people. He enables you to do it when he saves you. And the trouble is, again, that we're the opposite of Jesus at this point. We avoid obeying God. We're wanting to rest in our own ways of doing things. Effectively, we want to be God. Be God of our own little universe. But Jesus, well, he's so different. And he did everything. I've gone backwards. He did everything out of love. Love for the Father, love for his people. And this is the next point that is made here when he says it in verse 20. He's, he is one with the Father in their love. Jesus says all that he does is in unity with the Father and it's based on obedient love. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. How comforting to know that at the heart of God's nature is love. How do we know that God is love? Well, God says so explicitly. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, verse 16 says, God is love. You can read it there. But how do we know apart from that? Well, the answer is we know that God is love because of what Jesus 
is. Because what he's done, his actions, his words, we see his heart. And some will may say, oh yeah, but how about creation? The beauty of creation. Surely that's pretty awesome and good. Yeah, but if you point to creation, you've got to realise you only prove from creation that God is a God of order. The creation reveals nothing about love. Then maybe you might like to argue that some of the things God has created are useful to us and therefore reveal God's concern for us. But then there are other parts of creation that are even destructive, like a, a storm or an earthquake. But there's more to it, you see. Love has to do with personality. And that's what Jesus shows. People love. So how do we know that God is a person characterised by love? Well, it's through Jesus. He loved and gave himself for us. Here's the difference between Christianity and all these other religions which Edward Gibbon was talking about. Every religion was founded by a prophet who taught certain moral behaviour to bring you to God however you conceive God to be. But Jesus doesn't do that. Every religion would lose nothing if you took away its founder. You still have their moral code to live by to get you to heaven or nirvana or whatever you conceive it to be. But Jesus is the only one who is God come down to bring you to the Father. You don't need a prophet, you need a saviour. Take Buddha or Muhammad out of their religions and the religion remains intact. Can't take Christ out of Christianity. You don't have anything left. And finally, Jesus makes two more statements regarding his relationship to the Father. He says in verse 20, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he is doing, and greater works than these will he show you so that you may marvel or be amazed. And the greater things, well, they're described in the next verses. They are that the Son gives life to whom he pleases and that the Son will judge mankind on the Father's behalf. So he states the first claim by saying, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Now, any Jew listening on right then would know that. That's Old Testament 101. Every Jew knew that one day God would unleash... So, um, let's do life first. Any Jew knew verses such as Deuteronomy 32, where God says, I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. 1 Samuel 2 says, The Lord kills and the Lord brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. And, of course, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created. Jews knew this. They know it today. Giving life, whether in physical life, spiritual life, or life of the resurrection to come, that's God's prerogative. So when Jesus claims to give life like this, he's claiming to be God. And the same is true about judgment. Every Jew knew that one day God would unleash his final judgment. Deuteronomy again, in chapter 1, verse 17, declares judgment belongs to God alone. If Jesus is claiming that, he must be God. So here he is, he claims that he is God. From the beginning, at creation, to eternity, at judgment and beyond. And verse 23 tells us that God the Father has committed judgment to the Son. So, it's plain. Why? That all may honour the Son. That's what verse 23 says there. That all may honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. How do we do that? How do we honour the Son? Well, we need to acknowledge that He is who He says He is. We need to submit to Him, bow before Him at His teaching. Allow your opinions to be moulded by His Word your views to be conditioned by his. And this includes his uncomfortable and unfashionable teaching. And the more our secular culture moves away from him, it will become more unfashionable. 
And this includes Jesus' teaching about salvation. Sometime after this event in John 5, Jesus says he was going to the cross in order to give his life as a ransom for many. And then he said, right on the night before he was crucified, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Are these things true? They are if Jesus is who he says he is and I say that is true. If he's God, this must matter more than anything else in your life. He is the only way to the Father. Do you believe it? Do you really live it? Do you honour him in his teaching about salvation? Do you honour him in his teaching about the Christian life? He teaches you how to live to enjoy the fullness of of the rest which he died to give you. The Bible's full of his teaching. Do you follow it? It's the only sensible course for anyone. And there you'll find the true REM rest for your soul. Let's pray and then we'll sing. Righteous Lord, we realise that we tend to live according to our own standards of righteousness. And as we look in the mirror of your law, of your word, we are amazed. And especially we're amazed at the word, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And all he has done, help us to trust afresh, to rely anew, to sleep the true REM sleep of, our, of the soul, which would make our lives brighter, stronger, truer to you, not just now, but for eternity. In Christ we pray. Amen.